What kinds of movies have you been watching recently? I have been catching up with the uh, Oscar nominations mm-hmm. that I didn't get a chance to watch. So we watched uh, Jojo Rabbit. I just rewatched that the other day. Which I thought was hysterical. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so funny. So well written. I, I, there was two jokes that I, we had to stop the movie um, because of the, um, the clones. Uh-huh. The joke about the clones. And then the German Shepherd joke was just so out there. I <laughs> thought that was the funniest thing in the entire world. And, uh, it was, but I really, yeah, I really dug that movie. And, and, and I love those movies where you just kind of get, you get sucked in and then you should expect certain things to happen. So like, I love when movies, you know, suck me in like that. And like, I just kind of like get absorbed into the film and not really think about it too much. So but yeah, Jojo Rabbit was one. And what was the other one we saw? Um, I honestly can't remember. It was like back to back because I've, I've been watching like Star Trek um, Deep Space Nine because I never really watched that whole um, series all the way straight through. So I'm uh, refamiliarizing myself with that. And it's been interesting. So yeah, but there's a lot of, um, we watched uh, Knives Out. Yeah, I rewatched that recently it's superb. too. <laughs> it's superb. It's, it's so fantastic. Good. It's uh I didn't expect to like it as much as I did, but it's um, just, you know, Ryan Johnson's a great filmmaker. Yeah. I just don't think he should be doing any more Star Wars movies <laughs> and uh, he should just, just do his own original stuff because he's, he's, he's a really good writer when he's just kind of, you know, doing his own things. And, and so I liked, I liked Looper I, I, and I like mm-hmm. Knives Out and I'm really interested in seeing uh, what else he has, has uh, in store for us. Hopefully it's not Star Wars. <laughs> Hopefully it's just some, you know, just do whatever you want to do, but just don't do Star Wars. Everybody, welcome back to Cinescope. This is episode 88, and I am here talking with Eric Woods from Cinematic Sound Radio. And it's been a long time since you've been on the show, Eric. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well under all the different various circumstances that we don't need to delve oh, into. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I'm yes. doing good. As, as long as you're healthy and safe, then that's all we need to know. Yeah, I am both of those things, and I can podcast from home very comfortably. So <laughs> that's what yes. I'm continuing to do. Well, how about you reintroduce yourself to us? Last time you were on was actually to talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark a couple of years ago, right. episode 25 or so, I think. Um, yeah. So reintroduce yourself to us. Tell us about what you do, who you are, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, I, well, my name is Eric Woods. I'm the, the host and producer of Cinematic Sound Radio, which is now more of a podcast network. I still have my own show. But I think the last time I was on the program, it, I was just the only guy doing shows. And then I kind of put the, the word out saying, hey, if anybody wants to do film music radio, I'd be more than happy to, to host your program. And I uh, got uh, quite a few responses. And now I am think I'm up to like five or six shows. So I'm extremely busy. So we have like a video game show. We have a, well, we used to have a synthesizer film music show, which was actually really good. But that one had to go away. We have uh, an interview program. We have an archival show. Um, we just picked up a great show that's been going on for about 10 years, uh, Lee Bricknell's Filmic. And so she, I really think that she needed to, to find a, a new audience because she was having a tough time on her own. So I brought her on to Cinematic Sound Radio and uh, her show is thriving. So yeah, we're, we're, we're really busy. And, um, and since I'm also just completely busy on a personal note. Um, I don't have a lot of time to produce my own show. So these shows just fill the gap. So I'm super happy about that. And, uh, yeah, we're still going strong. So if anybody's out there and interested in film music radio or film music podcast then cinematic sound radio is your jam. That is awesome. I don't know if I realized that you were so busy. <laughs> I don't know if I was aware mm. of all the, the various shows that you were hosting. So I'm going to have to check out a couple of those. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. The video game show's great as well, uh-huh. but I'm really excited about, yeah, Lee Bricknell. I've been a fan of hers ever since she was on Radio Nowhere, and she has the most eclectic taste in, in film music. And I've even had the pleasure of meeting her. She came down to Ontario, so I got to have lunch with her, and she just has a, a wild 
taste in film music, everything from like show tunes to uh, 70s swinging type uh, film scores to modern stuff to, you know, you name it. And she does a great one hour show monthly. And, uh, and she's also just a, a warm, kind, caring, generous, interesting person. So if you ever get a chance to listen to it, film music should be the first one you, you listen to. Let's go ahead and go into our movie discussion. We are continuing our talk of the Indiana Jones franchise with not the second one, but the third one, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. This movie released on May 24th of 1989, was directed by Steven Spielberg. I don't need to go over his filmography. Um, uh, You know it. (laughs) It was written by Jeffrey Bohm, uh, who I think wrote the screenplay for Inner Space I was reading, uh, which we've talked about on the show as well. he did some great hits. Uh, I think there was Lethal Weapon 2 in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did The Phantom. He's a great writer. And the story was by George Lucas and Menno Mages. Mayes. Music is by John Williams. Again, I don't need to go over everything he's composed, although it's all <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> the movie stars Harrison Ford and Sean Connery as his father, which is a brilliant bit of casting. Yes. Allison Duty, Julian Glover, John Rhys Davies, and Denholm Elliott. So what was your first experience that you remember and your experience over the years with this movie, Eric? This one is, uh, this is as clear as day. And um, we saw this movie as a family at an old theater in Hamilton on James Street called the Tivoli Theater. It was the last film that ever played in this theater. Wow. It shut down in September of uh, 1989. And so... From what I read, uh, Last Crusade, yeah, was the last picture, and there was 42 people in the theater to actually see that last film. And once they exited, uh, they literally put the close sign on the door. Uh, When I went, it was opening week, and I can remember standing outside, um, waiting in line, and where we stood was right in front of the poster, the brilliant poster by uh, Drew Struzan. Mm -hmm. And I just absorbed every image because I had only seen a few trailers and unlike now where you can just get information about every film ever made and go in it and almost know what is going to happen before you've seen the film. I had no idea what this was about. So I had no idea there was this young Indiana Jones prologue. <laughs> I, I knew about the, the, the Holy Grail, but I really didn't know its mythology. Sean Connery was rather new to me. I mean, I was 12 years old. I didn't see a lot of movies at that time. I loved films, but, you know, I had no idea he was James Bond. But I remember going into this 1,000-seat old-school theater with red seats. It has a blue ceiling with all these yellow fleur-de-lis on the ceiling, huge chandeliers, um, a brilliant old-school lobby to get your popcorn. And I sat about halfway down to the theater close to the middle. And I just, I saw it. I'm like, what in the world is going on? Because I was (laughs) expecting to see Indiana Jones. I mean, I'd seen Raiders and I'd seen Temple of Doom by this point, of course, but I was like, who's this kid? And then, you know, of course, when you see uh, the man in the hat, I'm like, oh, that's Indiana Jones. And then when he turns around, I'm like, well, that's not Indiana Jones. That's some other guy, but he's dressed (laughs) just like him. Right. So I'm just confused for the first like 10, 15 minutes of this movie. <laughs> but of course you get that brilliant transition with the hat from young Indy to Harrison Ford on in the Portuguese coast. And I'm just, from that point on, I was just sucked into this movie and I loved every single minute of it. And I'm glad this was my first ever Indiana Jones experience in the theater. I didn't get a chance to see Temple of Doom or Raiders in the theater. I saw them both on television or um, on video cassette. It was just a magical time especially going to see this movie in this old theater. And it was like one of the last old theaters that I ever, like traditional old theaters to see a movie before everything became, you know, uh, multiplexes. And so just a fantastic experience. Man, to see something in such a unique place, I can see why that stands out so uniquely to you. That's really cool. Yeah, I only experienced that ever one other time and it was Return of the Jedi. Uh Saw it in another just expansive theater in downtown Toronto. It was a a two-story theater, again, just giant red seats and a huge uh, red curtain covered the screen. And we actually had to stand up for the national anthem before the movie started. Wow. It was an event. Yeah. And then, of course, just this massive screen, um, you know, just showing me all these amazing Star Wars characters and whatnot. So, yeah, it was, um, those are the only two times I think I've ever been in like a, a real traditional old school theater. I think the Tivoli Theater in Hamilton was built in the 18, late 1800s. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, has quite a bit of history, but yeah, really like you don't get that anymore these days. I don't think you just have those kind of unique experiences uh, watching movies. Yeah. Those kind of venues are certainly few and far between. I also like that you pointed out that it was your first Indiana Jones experience in the theater and why that makes it yeah. sort of special for you. Cause my first Indiana Jones experience in the theater was kingdom of the crystal skull. Oh no. And while I acknowledge that that's not a great movie, <laughs> I have some affection for it because of that being my first sure. experience. Right. And honestly, I probably would pick kingdom of the crystal skull over temple of doom. Although it's been a long time since I've seen <laughs> temple of doom. So no, we can have that discussion some other time. <laughs> Another uh, time for sure. <laughs> I, I will, yeah. I, I, I defend that film with my life. It's been a long time. Uh, I, I need to rewatch that one as well. So um, yeah. anyways, <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> how much of my Indiana Jones experience I shared in our Raiders episode. I couldn't find my notes, but uh, I didn't discover, quote unquote, discover Indiana Jones until probably my sophomore year of high school. My parents mm. aren't like super movie people. And uh, okay. so my dad didn't show me a whole lot of things growing up. I was familiar with Star Wars because we had the VHS tapes from the 80s. We had Indiana Jones, maybe, but I only caught like bits and pieces of them over the years. And so I finally sat down for the first time in high school and I fell, I fell in deep, Eric. <laughs> like I bought the hat at Disney World and walked around calling myself Indiana Chad deep. <laughs> right. Yes. I remember that story. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think that th the reason I first watched it in its entirety might have been because of a school project at some point. I can't remember exactly, but I do remember watching it for school, like a paper or something I had to write. And I loved it, especially this movie really stands out to me. Um, I think this is probably my favorite of the franchise, to be honest, maybe just narrowly beating Raiders. Mm. Uh, but I remember quoting this one a lot with my friends. We quoted the Sean Connery bits. I suddenly remember my Charlemagne. <laughs> right, uh, yeah, yeah. We used to re rewind that scene uh, of Sean Connery clucking and cooing at the birds <laughs> many it's times. It's hysterical. Yeah, it's so great. Yes. So this movie, in comparison to Temple of Doom, falls so much more in line with the adventure of Raiders and the, the sort of the mm -hmm. feel and the look of Raiders, but it also yep. brings a little bit more comedy to the forefront. And I think that might be why it stood out to me so much at the time, but now just acknowledging how much I like Sean Connery as Henry Jones and how much I enjoy all the fantastic chase sequences and action set pieces in this movie. There's so much to love here. Not that there's not as much to love in the others, but this one just really stands out for me and has always probably been my favorite. Yeah, I can see why. I mean, the big thing for me was, of course, the 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 father and son relationship. Mm -hmm. That is just gold. And if that doesn't work, this film becomes rather stale because it's admittedly it's Spielberg and George Lucas taking it safe after going completely in the, the, the most dark way possible with Temple of Doom. I mean, and there's a reason why, you know, it was so dark. Um, you know, they were going through some turmoil in their lives at that time but they mm -hmm. knew that it alienated a, some of their audience and so going back to a more traditional kind of globe trotting adventure seemed to be what they needed and i mean look it, even though it, it sort of hits the same sort of beats that raiders did in certain points i think they did enough unique things that it definitely does become its own but it's that father-son relationship where it's just the writing is gold and to find the right father for Indiana Jones. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure Sean Connery has quite an ego and, <laughs> um, you know, he's James Bond, he's Sean Connery, but the fact that he and, and Harrison Ford could have such incredible chemistry and make it seem like, yeah, this is, this was destined to be the person to play Indiana Jones's dad and the way that they play off each other. It's so brilliant and it's something that's completely missing from kingdom of the crystal skull. I mean, mm -hmm. that father son relationship is just the worst and there is <laughs> no chemistry between LaBeouf and Harrison Ford at all. Yeah. I mean, I would argue that Harrison Ford had more chemistry with the, I forget his name, sorry, but with the short round in, uh, in temple of doom. Kihoi Kwan. Yes. Than he did in, in kingdom of the crystal skull. So yeah, the father-son stuff in this is just absolute gold, especially at the end. I mean, and again, it's something that didn't really register with me until later on when I saw the movie about maybe the 40th time was just the change in 
in Sean Connery finally recognizing Indiana Jones for who he is and the respect that he had for his son due to their adventure and wanting his son to grab his hand, you know, to save him. And he was, you know, saying, hey, Junior, grab my hand. Junior, grab my hand. And in the moment when he calls him Indiana, I, I just get chills talking about it. And Indy, Indy, you know, swings around and finally, you know, gives his hand and, and Henry Jones Sr. saves Indy's life. But it's the Indiana line mm-hmm. that is just, that's the culmination of everything in this movie. That's it. That's the relationship. When they, you know, clasp hands together, that's the payoff. It's not the grail. It's that. And I love it. We talked about October Sky a couple of episodes ago, and I talked about how much these father-son relationships really mean to me in any film, Yeah, and it certainly played up here. And what's funny about it is that the casting of Sean Connery is almost a gimmick, like initially, because Indiana Jones was based on James Bond in part, and so who better to have play the father of Indiana Jones than the actor who originated the role of James Bond? Mm -hmm. And so- it's a gimmick in that respect, but then their their chemistry is so great together. The relationship plays off each other throughout the film. It builds and builds. We get so much history, even from the prologue scene about their relationship. Right. It is so fantastic seeing how how well those two work together, even though Sean Connery is only, I think, 10 years older than Harrison Ford. Well, exactly. Exactly. I mean, you could easily have had Sean Connery go, well, no. I mean, I'm how can I play his father? I'm only 10 years older, right? And it's like, mm-hmm. I'm James Bond. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm the hero. And what I also think is just like, he just kind of basically stripped down that hero persona and, you know, he's not wearing a wig. He's fully bald in this movie. You know, he's very, uh, vulnerable as a, as an older man, right? He's not the guy that's shooting the bad guys and, and, and saving everyone. Although like, as you mentioned, the, um, the umbrella scene, right? It's so goofy, you know, especially <laughs> for James Bond, but it's, I just love the fact that Sean Connery accepted the role and understood the role and what his part in the story was. And he wasn't the hero. And that's what I think is fantastic about this is just that he, you know, just basically gave in and said, yeah, of course I'll play that role and I'll I'll play it that way instead of being the, the starring, you know, hero. Right. Talking about other parts of the story, just from the the intro, we already talked about a little bit, but introducing us to young Indy is so great. We get classic character quirks without the directors winking too hard at us through the camera. I I think the the little bits, like the development of the fear of snakes or Mm -hmm. uh, giving a story reason for Harrison Ford's chin scar or where Mm -hmm. the whip or where the hat came from, they're, they're in there, but they build the character and it's just, it's not just Spielberg and Lucas saying, oh, wink, wink. You notice what we did here? Yeah. It also gives us good pieces of character building. We get the initial glimpse at his relationship with his father, how he says, no, 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 count to 20 in Greek. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so he he doesn't listen to him. He doesn't step in when the sheriff comes to take the cross back. We get the glimpse at his need to acquire artifacts, to put them in museums. And then we get that fantastic quote from the man in the hat who says, you lost today, but that doesn't mean you have to like it. And so that's a testament to Indiana's lasting resiliency. We saw it in Raiders of the Lost Ark. We've seen it here. There's just so much character stuff that happens in that initial prologue scene. And then the way it seamlessly transitions into the present day where he's reacquiring the Cross of Coronado it's such a beautiful transition. I love so much of the opening of this film. Yeah, it's a perfect opening. And, uh, river Phoenix, if there was anybody that was going to play a young Harrison Ford, he was perfect. And he did it Mm -hmm. a couple of years earlier in mosquito coast. And so, you know, their chemistry, you know, Harrison Ford's and river Phoenix's chemistry was already built by then. And, And river Phoenix already knew all of kind of Harrison Ford's, mannerisms like his the, you know certain way that he smirks or the certain way that he acts or a certain way that you know when he's surprised there's just certain you know Harrison Fordisms and he he picked up on those so perfectly but you're right i mean if you're looking for the perfect way to introduce to the audience who Indiana Jones is i mean and you think you already know who he is through you know the first two films in the series it's really a hard thing to do to kind of go back in the past and, and, and within about 12 or 15 minutes, give the audience all that information with, like, as you said, without it feeling gimmicky. And I can remember, you know, the 12 year old and me watching this movie, I, I loved every single little bit where 
oh, wait, that's why he's afraid of snakes. Or that's why, <laughs> you know, he gets the scar. That's why he gets, oh, that's the hat, that's the whip. And I'm like, totally bought into that as a 12 year old watching this. And so, again, just being sucked into a film and not really thinking of, oh, well, all that happened within a 12 minute span during a, a chase sequence. And it, it just, it just felt right. And it was so perfectly staged, so perfectly written, so perfectly shot. It is so perfectly scored. Mm -hmm. Everything about it is, it's just a wonderful, it's just a wonderful adventure within an adventure. And that's what I love about the Indiana Jones movies as well, right? You always kind of finish with one adventure and then, you know, begin the, the, the second adventure uh, about 20 minutes later on in the film. This movie also has some of the best action or chase sequences of not only the franchise, but of movies in general, honestly. Uh, the, the opening train sequence, the, the boat chase, the motorcycle chase, the plane in the car, the tanks. I mean, the tanks itself is like a 15-minute sequence. It is yeah. so great. And, you know, Harrison Ford does most of his own stunts. I think he injured mm -hmm. himself doing the, the jump from the horse to the tank, if I remember correctly. Um, so it might have been a stand-in just for that scene. I think he did the jump. I'm pretty sure of it because there's yeah. a close up of him riding the horse and then he kind of goes up on that hill. I, but there could be a cut and I'm not entirely sure now. <laughs> it's still, I mean, it's just a kick ass shot anyway. But yeah, I mean, well, I mean, like in Temple of Doom, he had, he blew out his back and I think he was out of commission for like six to eight weeks uh, while they did a whole bunch of other stuff around you know, Harrison Ford and they had even the stunt guys do some of the, the action sequences. And then when Harrison Ford came back, he did all his close ups. So, I mean, right. yeah, he's been beaten up in these movies. And what's interesting is that even the motorcycle chase was uh, a last minute addition. I don't think it was in the original movie and they needed something to pick up the pace at that time. And so mm -hmm. the bike chase, and you could tell, just look at Harrison Ford's hair, how long it is at the back during the chase scene. Cause he has a very, um, you know, short haircut along the sides. But then if you watch him, and I'm probably, you're never going to, you know, you're not going to unsee this. He has longer hair because they did it as a pickup and they just kind of put the hat on top of him. And so that whole sequence was done after the fact. Huh. And I mean, what a sequence. I didn't know yeah. that. No, I'm going to have to look that up now. I'm going to like have to rewatch that scene. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty yeah, great. Yeah. I, I already mentioned the little moments of comedy in this movie too, but I, I think that mm -hmm. the, there were funny things that happened in Raiders of the Lost Ark for sure. But I like that there was a little bit more leaning into the comedy here with it without it again being too much. You get the him as a teacher scene where he says X never marks the spot. And then not even mm -hmm. 20 minutes later, he's saying X marks the spot. <laughs> the stamping in the library, the Scottish accent he puts on at the castle, uh, his father starting the fire and shooting down their own plane. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, son, they got us. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. there, there's so many small moments of comedy that are never lingered on for too long. And it's never like slapstick, but it it is a nice reprieve from the intense action that we are seeing so much of the time too. And it helps to build often that relationship between father and son. That's key. Exactly. I mean, the, the father son dynamic and the fact that you have Henry Jones senior as being the fish out of water, mm -hmm. obviously you're going to have some sort of comedy wrapped around that. And both actors play it so perfectly. And I mean, there's one sequence it's, it's truly played for a gag. I mean, there's not a lot of stuff in here where it's like, hey, this sequence is definitely a comedic sequence, but the no ticket scene, <laughs> just it's the, the build up to that is when we won, it's, it's a, quite a suspenseful scene because you're wondering how in the world are they going to get out of this sequence or this situation? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you see, you know, Indy do what he does. And it's just a, it's a very, very funny sequence. And I didn't expect that. And, uh, but that one was really, kind of like I'm trying to think if there's any other sequences in these in these movies in the first three that just kind of play it for straight comedy and uh, I think that's one of the only ones and it was so good it was so well done do you have any more story things to point out before we start talking about character things I mean I'm not sure whether we save this for the music bit or I mean one of the funniest things the funniest gag begins at the beginning of the movie and doesn't pay off until the end. And that has to do with Indiana Jones's name, the origin of his name. Uh huh. And as you watch the end of the action sequence with the train, when Junior comes running home and we see kind of the push in on the, the, the Jones sign outside the house, there's a quick shot to the dog. And John Williams plays on the piccolo, the Indiana Jones theme, really quickly. It's da 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 da. And 
if you don't pick it up, you don't notice it. And of course, at the end of the movie, we find out that Indiana Jones is named after the dog. And that's a, that's a hilarious moment. But I just <laughs> love the fact that even John Williams knew about that gag. And when they showed the dog that he gave the dog Indiana Jones's theme. And I thought that it was just absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and you only catch it on subsequent listens or in, in subsequent watches of the, the film. So I, I love that gag because it's a, it's a visual and musical gag. It's so great. I love the little bits of Indy's theme in that opening prologue, but I don't think I had noticed the timing of the theme lined up with the dog. <laughs> so that's another thing I'm going to have to look for. It starts off very slow, I think, on like the, the strings. It's a da na 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 and then it just kind of goes when they see the dog, and it goes, da 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 It's like really quick, really cute, and, <laughs> and the dog barks over top of it as well, so you, you don't really notice it until, again, you're like, well, wait, there's the, there's the gag at the end of the movie, and then you go see it, watch it again, and you pay attention. Wait, hold on a minute. That was Indiana Jones' thing. That's, that's, that's hilarious. So, yeah, that's one, of my, that's one of my favorite little, like, Hey, check this out. Did you have you did you notice this parts of the movie? So I love that. And I love that. Yeah, the fact that we get to see the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. It's it's a good joke too. It I is think a good uh, joke. Sala uh just, you know, pays it off perfectly at the end too. So <laughs> yeah. It's a great joke. Well, talking about the characters now in indie at the start, I almost got a sense that he was getting tired of the professor life in favor of the adventurer life, even though he says in that opening lecture that archaeology has done 70% in the library with reading and research and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, but we see that he hasn't graded term papers. There's students who are wanting to ask questions because he's been gone getting out this cross of Coronado. And so I just got a little bit of a sense that he's aching for the next adventure more than maybe he normally is. That's not ever revisited, but just a thought. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it mirrors his father's obsession mm -hmm. with the grail. So he oh, had yeah. been obsessed all his life with the cross, and he was going to do anything and everything to get it. I mean, how, how long was he gone for, you know, like, uh, was it like the summer vacation that he took and then came back and it was, you know, the first day of school. But, you know, what's interesting about the cross of Coronado, and, and if I can remember correctly, it's the only piece that he finds that he actually gets to keep because uh, he doesn't get the arc. He captures the stones, but has to give that back. That's fair. Uh, the grail, of course, falls down the pit. And so the cross is like really his only victory. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that thing that he, he wanted all his life and he finally got it. And it's interesting to see it at that way. But again, yeah, it mirrors the obsession kind of theme that goes through the film. So you might be right. Cause I mean, he was obsessed about it at that time and he wanted to get it back. And so, you know, you know, he, the school life was something very secondary and even his escaping, you know, his office through the window and mm -hmm. not wanting to do anything. Yeah. And it, it, he might just be, well, I mean, unless you then see the fourth one, he's still doing what he's doing, but yeah, it might just be kind of like, he doesn't care about it anymore. Yeah. I think he nailed it on the head with the mirroring of his relationship with his father uh, or his father's same obsessions, even though he's critical of his father's obsession with the, the quest for the grail. Right. We see the same behavior imitated in him which is something that sort of recurs throughout the film elsa keeps saying you're so much like your father not just in the way you look but right. in the way you get giddy when you make certain discoveries correct and indy every time that happens in the movie is indignant elsa at one point says you're exactly like your father and he, his response is except he's lost and i'm not he doesn't want to be compared to him. He doesn't want to be called junior. He wants to be his own right. person. And even though their, their sort of life course has followed a similar path, Indy is the one who has left the point of strict research at this point and is more about exploration and adventure and that kind of stuff. So he's trying to mm -hmm. expand that, that divide between him and his father. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So what makes this film so great? And I, it's, it's, it's why you know, Harrison Ford is, is willing to revisit this character over and over again, instead of somebody like Han Solo, who he just thought was, you know, dramatically dead, because there's always so many interesting stories you can tell about Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is so great. There's, it really is. This one, it really is a character study. Yeah. And I think that, again, you, you had to play that right, because you're, you're basically telling Indiana Jones's lore here and his personal backstory and his relationship with his family. And it's, I mean, again, you don't get that right. It fails miserably. And again, I, I just, I will state how they messed it up with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. 
and they just really didn't pay attention to that dynamic. But at least here, there was just so many, there's just so many things that are happening with these two. And I love the fact that, you know, you know, Indy and, and, and his dad could just sit, have a drink and talk, but then they basically don't say anything. And then they go back to archaeology. It's just fascinating how their, how their relationship is broken. Um, and it was brilliantly, um, you know, explored in the young Indiana Jones uh, chronicles as well. So I'm just so glad that they, they explore the fact that these two men, as much as Indy's a hero, you know, they're both flawed. And I love that. I love that aspect of this, of the telling of this story and, and, and exploring these characters. That's something I've always wanted to watch the young Indiana Jones Chronicle. I've never seen any episodes of that, honestly, but I'd love to check it they're out. They're fun. They're, they're fun. Yeah. yeah, they're fun. Some, some aren't great, but it's, it's a revolutionary television se- series and uh, there are some pretty amazing episodes. And so, yeah, check them out if you can. Yeah, I definitely will. You were talking about how broken their relationship is, but I also love that you see their similarities and you see their shared love for knowledge and for discovery when they first run across mm-hmm, each other in the mm-hmm. castle. And while, while you're seeing Indy say, well, I used your grail diary and I found this and I found this and it led to this. And they, they share in the, the joy of those revelations. Yes. But then at the same time, you see them conflicting with each other. Oh, you brought the diary here. I told you not to bring, or I, I sent it to you. So you didn't bring it here. <laughs> yeah. And there are moments when Indy looks to his father after an accomplishment, namely the, the, the main thing items that stand out to me are during the motorcycle sequence. When, he escapes on the motorcycle and side scar after distracting them with the boat. He looks to his father and he's oh, ho hum. I don't care that this is something significant that you just accomplished. Yeah. Or when Indy stops the other bikes, there is one small moment that Henry doesn't show Indy when Indy gets the pole and lowers it to joust. And Henry's like, Oh wow, you're jousting. That's pretty cool. It is especially because they're on a quest. They're on a crusade for the, the quest of the uh, Holy right. grail. And so it, it, makes sense and henry sort of geeks out for a second but after indy does it henry is just like he, do- he doesn't show that affection he keeps it to himself yeah it's interesting to see just how much henry jones senior doesn't know about his son i mean uh-huh. he knows that I, I guess he knows that he's an archaeologist but i mean for crying out loud like five minutes after saving his dad he you know grabs a gun and murders like three nazis it's yeah. like what <laughs> yeah look what you've done <laughs> <laughs> right? And so that's, it's like, holy smokes, how do you process that? Right. My, what does this, this is what my son does. But then I think that it's like, once they go to the next room, right. And Elsa's uh captured, I'm, I'm just wondering what senior is expecting. Right. Cause he says, you know, like Elsa's the, you know, it's the Nazi as well. And was he expecting Indy to mow them down too, after seeing what he just did, you know, in, in the other room. And I'm just kind of curious as to, you know, what the end game was there for, for Henry senior. And I actually just thought about that now. I was like, what in the world did, did uh, senior expect <laughs> right. from that scene? But yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, their relationship is, it's so three-dimensional, four-dimensional. There's just so much happening. And I'm just glad we got this story. I really am. Because like I said, you could just easily have just, you know, retraced Raiders of the Lost Ark and made your money. But they really wanted to tell a dynamic, interesting, personal story. And it's so good. Yeah. And that scene you mentioned earlier where they're just sitting, having a drink together. Yeah. Indiana talks about how he wasn't a great father and Henry's just Mm -hmm. not able to see that. He doesn't understand how he wasn't a great father. He says, I I taught you self-reliance. Right. And just because Indiana learned self-reliance in Henry's lack of parentship Mm -hmm. (laughs) doesn't mean that he actually taught him anything. He, it just meant that Indiana had to fend for himself and that's not being a father. That's right. And as they explore together throughout the movie, he is at first appalled by his son's sort of penchant for shooting and for killing. Uh, Then he's just unimpressed as they escape on the motorcycles. And eventually uh, we get to the the tank sequence and he blows up a car with the tank. So, I mean, he's he's learning from his son at the same time that he's starting to see what his life is like and understanding how similar they are in a lot of respects. And you mentioned the scene where he called him junior all movie, but finally he calls him Indiana as Indy is reaching for the grail. And I wanted to ask, Mm -hmm. because I I, I wasn't sure of an answer for this. Do you think that Indiana was reaching for the grail because he was sort of overcome in the moment by the, the thought of owning the grail? Or do you think as I I'm starting to sort of lean this way that it might've been, 
I'm here with my dad. My dad has been searching for this all his life. I'm going to grab the grail for my dad. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's both. Okay. And it's, that's a good point. Cause I was, I mean, I, I was just thinking it from Indy's point of view. It was like, Hey, you know, it's, it, I've just lost every single piece of treasure that I've ever gone after except for the cross. Uh-huh. And, you know, he's, he saw that, you know, Elsa was going for it, but now, you know, he was literally touching it and he could get it. Um, I don't know whether he was thinking of his dad at that moment, but that's a good point. And he might have been, I just think that he's just reaching out and he know we can get it. And if he just has another couple of seconds, he'd be able to, to get it and just kind of blindly picking it up without thinking of the consequences. But it's a good point as to whether he was doing it for his dad or not. Because I mean, the whole, the whole point of the, the even the grail search just kind of ends the moment that a senior gets shot. It's not about acquiring it. It's about right. saving his dad's life. And then of course that's turned on its end when senior has to save junior. And it's not necessarily about the cup. It's about, it's about family. So, but that's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. It was just a thought I had while watching this time specifically. I don't, I don't know if that had even occurred to me in the past, but I was thinking, you know, is this something that he's trying to do for his dad while they're together? But who knows? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I really don't know, but that's a good, it's a, it's not a, it's not wrong to think that way. Yeah. And I, and now I'm like, I'm going to view it a different way <laughs> when, I, when I go and see it for sure. We get two great villain characters here. Do you have anything to say about Elsa? Elsa's fantastic. And, and I love all three women in this series. Uh-huh. And the, they all come at this, in this series, a, a different way. Like, you know, Marin's a very strong woman. She's an independent woman. And, you know, she's not going to take any crap from anybody. Whereas the flip side, I love Willie for being the traditional damsel in distress uh, from those, you know, B serial movies that George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, you know, saw as kids. And here you got a double crosser. And on top of that, she is a beauty. I mean, she is, Allison Duty's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And she is just like this. And she's like the perfect Bond girl, but just you don't know what side she's going to be on. Although you think she's on Indiana Jones' side at the beginning, but she's just so, she's so fantastic. I mean, Heck, she was a Bond girl. I mean, her first role was a view to a kill. So she is, I think she has the most difficult job out of any of the three women in the Indiana Jones series. She is maybe the most, yeah, the most dynamic, especially during the book burning sequence, Mm -hmm. because you can see how conflicted she is. I don't think she's a Nazi. I just think that she, she's much like Indiana Jones and she just wants the grail she doesn't care about who gets it Mm -hmm. and um she doesn't agree with what the nazis stand for and her crying and her really being upset about all that very dynamic and i thought so allison duty was was fantastic and i would have liked to have seen more of her in more dramatic roles but i mean i honestly don't know what else happened to her i mean she's still working Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I, I, I thought she was, she was fantastic. And I, that's why I like it. All three women just played three different, completely different roles. And, um, she's really good in this movie. From Elsa, you get the, the comedy bits with the sort of shared relationship between the father and son, which is weird, mm-hmm. but <laughs> it's funny. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. And I didn't get that till I was older either. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm 12. I'm like, ah, I don't understand, but everybody's laughing. And I was like, oh my Lord. Uh, but Elsa is also an opportunist is how I viewed her. Mm-hmm. Uh, she aligns mm-hmm. herself with the Nazis because they give her right. the best chance of finding the grail unimpeded. Right. She says in that scene, you mentioned that she believes in the grail, not in the swastika. She has tears as she's watching right. all these books burning. Cause she That's is. Right. A doctor. She is somebody interested in the pursuit of knowledge. And in the end, of course, she does get wrapped up in the capacity of the grail, what it can do for her. Mm -hmm. But up to that point, she was after the the grail for the same reasons that Henry was basically for the discovery of it. And something else that sort of occurred to me this time, maybe this isn't new information, but in the actual scene where the grail is picked, uh, I think that she picked the wrong cup on purpose to get rid of Donovan. Yes. Absolutely. She's so sly there. Yeah. It didn't even occur to me until this watch, but absolutely she does. She has a sort of self-satisfied smile as he takes a drink. 
And then after yep. he dies, she, she is the one who says it would not have been made of gold. And right. I don't know if I'd ever caught that before. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And it's so sly yeah. of her. And that's what makes her so great. Yeah. She, she did it earlier. So you have no idea what side she really is on. And you're right. It's, it's all about her. She's extremely selfish mm-hmm. to the point that, well, I mean, again, she's like, hey, when she actually has the grail, walks past the seal and she just, she doesn't run out. She's just expecting to get some sort of like acknowledgement from Indiana Jones. Like, hey, yeah, we got it. Now we can go instead of like her just saying, I'm going to take off with it and go. She's looking for some sort of approval of what she has done and hoping that what she has done is right, even though she just basically broke all the rules that the, the knight had just told her 10 minutes ago or 10 mm-hmm. minutes earlier. And even the same thing, like just before she dies, it's all very much um, a selfish thing. She knows that she's slipping and she wants to get that grail no matter what, and it costs her life. So, yeah, I, I, I love her character and, and the way that she's portrayed in this movie. Well, speaking of being selfish, we have Donovan on the other side of the villain coin who at first seems to be sort of a kindred spirit to Indiana regarding uh, mm. antiquities and putting them in museums. He, Andy notes his contributions to the museum over the years. But through the course of the film, we learn that his accomplishments likely came at the hands of somebody else's work and discovery, not his own. Yeah, And that's the, the main part of his character, I think, is he's all in it for the discovery. For the grail, he's in it for selfish reasons. He wants to live forever. But he isn't putting in the work himself to get there. He's relying on Dr. Schneider. He's relying on Henry Jones and his research of the grail and Indiana's work there at the end and getting through the challenges. So that that's what stood out to me most about Donovan here is how even, even in the, the grail room, Elsa is the one who picks out the cup for him. Of course, she says that she will pick it out for him. Yes. But at this point, he has put all of her trust in her because she was the one with the knowledge. She's the one with the doctorate and she's the one who's d- yeah. done a lot of research along with Henry. And so he had so blindly put his faith in other people rather than doing work on his own, that it was his downfall. Yeah. You nailed it. I got nothing else to say. Just, <laughs> you, you nailed it. Absolutely. That's exactly the way he's portrayed. You yeah. know, that guy just, if he, you know, whatever money he has and he'll hire the right people and yeah. hopefully they take him to the right places. And you know, there's no way he's going through those trials at the end of the, uh, at the end of the movie, um, you know, he was last man standing. He probably would have turned around, packed it up and said, well, that's it. I'm not going. Yeah. Cause he had no idea. You're right. He was just a collector. He, he sort of knew some of the history, but he had no idea how to do any of this stuff. So he relied on other people and that's what cost him his life. Now our other two main characters, I, I don't have a whole lot to say about either of them, but we've got both, uh, Marcus Brody and we've got Salah. Do you have anything to say about them? Yeah, I think they're the only two mistakes in the movie, honestly. They, Donovan's character basically changes, and I don't like his transformation in this because I felt that he was a smarter, older archaeologist mm-hmm. or, or someone who actually did know his way, but you know, he was just too old to go on these adventures. And yeah, he seemed like a fish out of water, but he just kind of like he was just too much comic relief, I think, in this, in this movie that just basically changed him from being someone who's smart to a bumbling idiot. And, and I don't, I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. I I don't think that he needed to necessarily be in this movie. Um, and Solo's return, uh, it was nice to see him. And there were a couple of interesting gags, but again, I never felt like he had to be comic relief. So those are the only two characters. Like, honestly, if we didn't have them in the movie, I don't think, I think it probably would have been better. You could have maybe changed a few things in order to get us to certain points in the, in the film. But um, I mean, the, the gag with Donovan being, you know, five days ahead of, or three days ahead of everybody. And he knows everyone and speaks a dozen languages and all that sort of stuff. And then of course he's, we cut to him and he has no idea what's happening. Right. And that's where I just felt like I thought that Donovan was a smarter man and not a bumbling idiot. Brody. So that kind of bothered me. He does sort of change about halfway through the film. It doesn't bother me too much, but you're right. He, we probably could have done without him. Solo really doesn't have a whole lot to do here. I wouldn't say he's really yeah. there just for comic relief. It is nice to see him. There were just a couple things I noted, uh, moments that I liked from him because Sala was the, the, the nice guy, the guy who loves everybody. Right. And so as Henry is hanging off the side of a tank 
and he could possibly die. Sala comes up to rescue him on the horse, but first he raises his fez and he's like, oh, father of Indy, <laughs> reach out your hand. Yes, I'll, I'll right. save you. Yeah, I thought that was right. really funny. Um, yeah. And uh, then in the cave, after they have acquired the grail, he holds the gun up to the Nazis and says, drop your guns, please. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just right. a yeah. testament. We see Sala in Raiders of the Lost Ark. We get a lot more of him there and we get more of his character there but he's introduced as a a family man who's very affectionate he's very helpful and we just get more of that here uh yes a couple of laughs but he is just a nice guy and so i I like that we get more of nice guy sala i think maybe if he was the accumulation of of him and then and then what donovan was doing i probably would have appreciated that i just didn't understand why donovan had to join the adventure you know because he says that it's like you know you don't get me two tickets to venice i think Mm -hmm. that's what it was yeah and he's like, oh, yes, I'm coming too. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why? I don't understand. And I mean, I, I guess Henry was his friend, but it's like, I don't, I don't see the reason why you have to join this adventure. But yeah, I think then if Sala was the combination of those two, then I think I would have been all right with it. Yeah, that makes because sense. Sala, Sala, I just, Sala's just, he's more memorable. And, and that's the only thing that bothered me. Yeah. You could have just left Marcus at the beginning of the film. I think uh, so. Giving his warnings yeah. and his, his little speeches about faith. And about yeah. it coming with age in certain respects. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. I don't think yeah. we needed him to come on the adventure. That's, you know, it's minor. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and go into the music. Something I'm trying to do a little bit more often is I've got sound clips of all the, the sort of main themes or just a couple random moments as well throughout. So we talked about the opening chase sequence and how fantastic and perfectly scored all of that is. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're a family guy person. I'm not really, yep. but I love the scene where Peter is just like, let's sing along to the opening chase music from Indiana Jones and the last crusade. <laughs> it's right. really yeah, funny if you haven't ever best. seen that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I love it. we, we get that clip here. And what I love about that is it kind of sort of, at least to my ears comes back in the boat chase sequence. Let me show you and see if you agree. Sure. I mean, it's definitely like Venice up. Like it's, it's used yeah. with a guitar, but it's the same sort of similar shape to the music. At least it's not a copy, but it's something I noticed this time through. I never put the two together. Yeah. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. And then we get lots of various themes. Uh, we get the, the standout moment where they're walking through the, the tomb under the library and they play the arc theme for a moment as they pass a painting of the arc or something, yeah. which is really great. But then we get other themes for the other artifacts in this movie. Uh, we even get one for the cross, which is only featured in mm-hmm. the first 10 minutes, but we yeah. get this fantastic little cross theme. Are there any musical themes that stand out to you before I just like play them all? <laughs> uh, I, I love the, yeah, I love that, that cross theme. And, um, the one that really sticks with me is, yeah, it's the, uh, the grail theme is, is fantastic. It's this mm-hmm. quasi religious theme. That's just so perfect. And the thing is, you know, Williams could have easily injected, um, you know, chorus over top of it, but it, there's none of that to be, heard with the exception i think of a few moments just before the leap from the lion's head mm-hmm. um there's a I, and i think even the chorus there is synthesized but it, he could have easily gone that route and i just love the uh i'm not sure how i can describe it but just it's so warm and and so it's just i mean the perfect musical there's way of 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 capturing what the grail is all about it's so it's so perfect it almost in certain ways reminded me of just like the quest for knowledge and sort of academia Mm -hmm. they've used it in the video games like the lego indiana jones game i used to play when i was a kid they are great walking around i think you walk around the college or something and it's sort of like the academic theme at least that's the way it's used there uh let me see if i've got the right one pulled up here Uh, i don't think is that the right one? No, that well, see, what's so great about that theme, which is the the father son sort of Henry Jones right. senior theme, is that it, they 
it's almost tough to distinguish or or separate that theme with the Grail theme because they're they're interlocked and they right. usually play back to back, and 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 that's the genius of John Williams. He just knows that you cannot separate those two, and so they're very similar in style. But it just this the the Grail theme has this kind of warmer. It's more of a motif mm-hmm. than it is a fully developed theme like the. The father's son, or I don't know. If that, I don't really think that's the father's son theme. I think that's Henry Jones's theme because the father's son theme is a little bit more playful. It plays during the Keeping Up with the Joneses that sort of rarely plays in the in the movie anyway. But yeah, both of those themes they're interlocked, and right. you, you really can't have one without the other. Yeah, I might in, I might put in the actual Grail theme in post because I don't have it on a button here. Here's the father son yeah. theme you were talking about. Yeah. Or is, yeah. Well, there's, well, there's even the the one that wasn't used in Keeping Up with the Joneses. Um, mm-hmm. And I wish I could hum it, but I can't right now. Um, but that theme, that's the, the car chase after they crash the plane mm-hmm. and then they make their way to the beach and, uh, you know, the, the whole seagull attack thing. Um, so that cue is mostly, yeah, that whole scene is mostly unscored. Um, but there was a cue that was written and it's actually on the soundtrack, um, that features this kind of father son theme. Yeah. So I'll put both of those themes in here just so everybody can identify them. This is the last one I have on the soundboard, at least. This is the the Nazi theme. <laughs> Which is fun. Like, every time we see a swastika, that plays. <laughs> yeah. And what's interesting about that, actually, is compared to the, the Nazi music we hear in Raiders, it, it really has a more, of a more of a comedic tone to it. Like, you know, the mm-hmm. bumbling idiot Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> rather than how threatening they are in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. Well, they're not really the threat here. Even though Elsa and Donovan align themselves with the Nazis, it's not India against the Nazis necessarily here. Right. 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 Yeah, it's just fun to hear it because, yeah, it, it doesn't, it, like you said, it, it's not menacing. It's almost kind of like those uh, tongue-in-cheek evil theme that we would hear mm-hmm. in like a B-movie. It's traditional B-movie bad guy motif, and I think it's fun. It is fun. Any other musical things you wanted to point out? I mean, it's, I couldn't like say this is my favorite over any other Indiana Jones score. That's something thankfully that is really great about all of them is that they're all scored by Williams and they're all fantastic. Yeah. There's, um, you know, there's just little things like, I mean, we mentioned the, the, the piccolo theme for the dog. One other aspect I love, I, I love that kind of that, that pounding pulse that you hear during the escape uh, from Venice. It comes in during the latter half of the, uh, the queue. And that's when you see the rudder of Mm -hmm. the boat. And, you know, if you watch it just with the sound effects off and just listen to it with the music, the music's matching kind of the pounding um, and, and, and circling swirl and the danger of that rudder. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it keeps getting faster and faster and faster until also eventually saves everybody. But I just I, I, I love that sense of that sense of danger. And, you know, you're just wondering how in the world Indiana Jones is going to get out of that sequence because, you know, he's willing to basically sacrifice himself for whatever reason. Um, but he comes that close to death and just Williams is just pounding away, Mm -hmm. um, at that cue. And, um, and you know, there's just, there's some wonderful woodwind writing during, uh, especially that sequence where, and we talked earlier about it, where, you know, Indy jumps onto the tank during the tank chase sequence from the horse. And there's just some absolutely thrilling, uh, woodwind writing. You know, because mostly, you know, you think about action music, it's big brass, it's heavy, it's horn heavy, it's percussive. And and here Williams is just letting it roll with the with the woodwinds and doing some incredibly difficult playing. Um, so, you know, little things like that are, well, like even the, 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 
the, the, it's very short. It's like 40 seconds long, but the journey to Austria, it just has this kind of like theme that you, you only hear once and you'll never hear it again. And it's just this lovely traveling theme as they drive their way through to Austria. So, you know, little things like that. I mean, I love the themes and I love the big action set pieces, but I just love kind of like digging in and deeper and especially these classic scores to kind of find those, those little nuggets that are like, Hey, you know what? Williams was actually having a, a lot of fun at this moment. Um, you know, during these, these 12 seconds where it's like, you know, what was he doing and what was he actually, you know, trying to, to say. And, and, and so that's, those are those little things that I, that I really enjoy from the score as well. Oh, and of course, I mean, you get one of the greatest action, um, end credit sequence sequences of all time yeah. as well. I mean, just the greatest it's John Williams is so good writing end credit cues and uh, this is one of his all time best as well. I agree on that point, especially, uh, you mentioned some of his woodwind writing specifically, but I think his string writing is also a standout here. Uh, I can't oh, think yeah. of any specific moments, but he does some crazy string writing in certain places. There's, I don't think I'm seeing any particular part, but it, stuff like bum, 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 There's just like lots of fast string movements that I, I mean, I'm not a string player. I'm a brass player, but mm-hmm. I could never mm-hmm. even imagine moving my fingers like that. <laughs> and so I'm glad that there are people who can <laughs> because we get stuff that's featured in here. Yeah. And, and even though it sounds difficult from what I've heard, and I think even Conrad Pope had said this, that even though the, the writing sounds difficult and that, you know, some of it's fast and furious and there's like 16th notes and 32nd notes, it's just that everything is playable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he keeps it within a certain range. He doesn't make the music so difficult to play that you're like, what in the world is this? But I mean, Williams is... I mean, I think his forte is string writing. And if you mm-hmm. listen to any of his string elegies, he's just so good. And he even pours it on in this film, especially when, when Henry Jones is finally saved and, you know, they pour the, the holy water on, on, onto him and it fixes the bullet wound. You know, there's this big, expansive uh, string piece. And or when Indy finally sets foot on the, the invisible bridge over top of the chasm, by the way, Seeing that for the first time in the theater, especially that particular scene again, it's like how in the world is Indiana Jones going to get out of this? And the fact that he actually takes this step, I jumped out of my seat when he landed because <laughs> I was like, what is happening? And even the bullet, the shot that was going, that, that when they shot uh, Henry Sr., I mean, that, that sound effect was so, it just, it rang forever. The, the, the reverberation of that and just that, that jump, I... There's so many things that surprised me in this movie. And those are two particular sequences. But like when Indy finally puts his foot down on the bridge, you know, Williams, again, just the, the orchestra, it just, it ramps up and you get these, this beautiful, like, you know, kind of like, like I said, quasi religious theme as he walks across the bridge. And it's just so satisfying. He's just a great string writer. He is. I have one more musical moment to mention uh, before we move on. And it's again from the opening credit sequence. What I love about that opening chase scene in particular, aside from the little fun things, is how he hints at Indiana's future theme, but never plays it in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And we get stuff that sounds sort of like his main theme. Uh, There's this, I call it the hero theme from the beginning right here. So that, that's not anything that we really ever hear anywhere else, but it right. reminds you of Indy's main theme, like official Raiders March, those high trumpets. Right. And I, I'm not the type of person that enjoys those kind of like, oh, the, the, the main character can't get his main theme until he earns it. Uh, <laughs> I just, I don't buy that sort of stuff. It's like play the darn theme, but it makes sense in this particular moment, especially you know, you finally hear a real grand statement of it when he, you know, does the magic trick and eventually escapes from the train and, and fools the bad guy, well, the quote unquote bad guys. And that's when Williams, you know, lets out not a big overdone heroic statement of the theme, but it's on, I think it's on solo trumpet. And he just plays, dun, 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 dun. And, and, and that's when he gets away and it's not played in full, but I think that's just a great statement of, oh yeah, you know, the kid is doing Indiana Jones stuff and he did a certain Indiana Jones thing in order to get away. Mm-hmm. And Williams plays him off that way, but not in like a full hero version of it. And, um, and you only hear the kind of the full heroic version of it when Indiana Jones is actually Indiana Jones and he escapes by swinging off the boat on the Portuguese coast. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, then the boat blows up. But just before that, you know, there's this grand statement 
of uh, Indy's theme in full brass. And so the whole setup of that, I mean, that's what, 15, 16 straight minutes of music from the beginning of the movie to the end of that sequence? Yeah, pretty much. And all of the, all of the sync points he has to hit and all of the themes he has to play. I, I, where do you, <laughs> it, the musical storytelling is just, it's flabbergasting. And it, unreal. I mean, it's just, if you're going to do a master class on musical storytelling, just play Indy's very first adventure all the way straight through to the end of the Portuguese coast. And that's your lesson for the day. It's incredible stuff. Yeah. Nobody does that kind of stuff like Williams for sure. Now moving on to our final discussion section, the impact of the film, the, the themes and takeaways, how it's impacted you and your viewing of movies maybe over the years. Uh, is there anything that stands out to you? Um, you know, not any specific themes, although it, you know, since becoming a father 13 years ago, um, you know, any film dealing with fathers and sons has a bit more of an impact and a bit more meaning. So, you know, the specific scenes between Indy and, and his dad and where they can't communicate, you know, you can sometimes feel, I mean, especially when I, I got a 13 year old. And, you know, trying to get any information out of him is, it's like pulling teeth. And so, <laughs> you, you know, you, you also question whether you're doing things right as a, as a dad, but then you can also, you know, feel the way that Indiana Jones is feeling as well. And it's like, was your dad absent or did he teach you the right way? Like, and, and I mean, I had a fantastic relationship with my father, so I've got no problems with that. So he's my hero, but I just hope that I'm doing the same thing for my kid. And I'm just kind of leading him on the right direction and that he becomes something, um, he just becomes the best person he can be. And so, yeah, th th and again, that's why this film is so, especially now, so very important because of the father-son relationship. So, I mean, there's a few technical things that I think are, are important in this movie as well. But I mean, as for thematic ideas and, and storytelling and things of that sort, that's what I really take away from it now. I... Definitely agree on the, the elements of the father and the son relationship that stand out. I also have a good relationship with my dad and I'm not a father now, but I, I like that that has such impact for you. Mm. And it's, I mean, again, it's what stands out for me. Uh, but then there's just the ideas of fact versus truth. That's something that he talks about in his initial speech as a professor in this movie mm. about how archaeology is a search for fact versus truth. And surface level, those are the same things. But I think that the, the implication is that truth includes sort of like a greater truth of maybe a higher power that this movie is sort of uh, setting you up for. And uh, you get Kazim from the Brotherhood in Venice who says, my soul's prepared, how's yours? And so there's all these little moments throughout the film that le that are preparing Indiana for those final challenges when he has to embrace sort of his faith in things and his knowledge at least of the the Christian perspective in order to overcome those challenges there's also the idea of a difference in perspective of you see that in Elsa who aligns with the Nazis to find something important even though she's not a Nazi she's sort of taking on that perspective and and then there's Indy telling Henry that he wasn't a great father versus Henry thinking the opposite. Mm -hmm. So it's all a matter of perspective in that relation. And then there's just the idea of the discovery for the sake of discovery versus for personal gain. Um, and it's the downfall of the man in the Panama hat with the cross of Coronado. Mm. And it's the downfall of both Donovan and Elsa in the end of the film. Whereas the people who were just after the discovery, Henry, Indiana, team, they're the ones who make it out at the end. And that's sort of what, I mean, that's what happens with Indiana in all of his movies is he's searching for something for the sake of searching for something and maybe to prevent somebody else from getting it or to put it in a museum because it belongs in a museum, but it's never for personal glory or for personal gain. It's interesting because, you know, in, when you, you watch Temple of Doom, Indy goes through a transformation in that as well, which mm -hmm. is sort of similar. I mean, because it's all about the, hey, fortune and glory, right? And then all of a sudden he realizes that, you know, there's a, whole group of kids that are slaves in the in the mines and he basically gives up that fortune and glory to become a true hero and so um yeah over the course of all these movies there's always this kind of transformation with indiana jones where he kind of digs deep and sees deeper inside of himself and what type of person he's going to be but i mean like i said we, it was interesting to see that he finally kind of won for the first time yeah, <laughs> you know, ever. <laughs> and so it's like, uh, yeah, you know, they got the cross and I was like, well, you know, like, what in the world do I do with this thing? 
And then it's interesting the the, the change between yeah the, the the it belongs in a museum which seems to kind of go against everything that we might have learned about Indiana Jones but maybe it's him growing up but I mean because he says it as a kid but it doesn't seem to be his mantra going forward as an adult in Raiders and in Temple of Doom so kind of conflicting there I think but um, I'm not sure whether he was thinking the same thing with the Ark and the the Shankara stones and the other two movies. Again, I can't really speak about Temple just because it's been so long since I've seen it. Mm. But with Raiders, I'm thinking he is sort of after it for per- not personal gain. Like he doesn't want the contents, but he does want sort of the glory of the discovery of it, I think, is what entices him in the first place. Yeah. But in the end, it is about, well, putting it away safely so Nazis don't get a hold of it ever again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, right. exactly. still, not, yeah. not for himself in the end. Now, not a theme, but just something as a video gamer. Something that has lasted from this movie across all adventure games, basically, is the Grail Diary. Like, it's become the classic adventure video game companion, specifically in, like, Uncharted. I don't know if you've ever played the Uncharted games or are familiar with them. No. But Nathan Drake is the main video game character. He's very much an Indiana Jones kind of person. And he carries around this diary, and it's how you remember things from previously in the game, and it's how you tackle new things because you're looking in this. And so I don't think they could have predicted it, but Spielberg and Lucas here have created this grail diary that is now like a staple of adventure video games, which is so cool. Yeah. And you're right. The new Laura Croft movie did the exact same thing. And there was a father daughter relationship in that one, but it was based on, you know, this diary and the information that her dad had and that led her on the adventure. So you're right. I wonder if that actually does, did begin with last crusade. I don't know, but that's, um, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to do some research on that. Do you have any final thoughts about the movie or anything that you haven't said yet? Well, you know, it, it was the absolutely perfect ending to the trilogy. Not <laughs> yeah. only in the name, the, the name, The Last Crusade. It's like, oh, that's perfect. The last mm-hmm. of something, right? And it's like, you couldn't have found a better name for the third movie in Indiana Jones series that was supposed to be the last. But that, that last shot of them riding out into the sunset is so beautiful. And then, of course, you know, just before that, they're, they're racing out of the temple, with, uh, you know, on their horses, and Indiana Jones' theme is playing. And, and even during the end credits, we get to see them riding off into the sunset. And I was like, wow, how, there is no better way to end a trilogy of movies than that. So as much as I, I don't like Crystal Skull, I still consider this a trilogy. Yeah, and then yeah. whatever that was is, I, I still think it's a tight trilogy of movies made by Spielberg at the height of his you know career, and it was just a great way to kind of cap that that almost childlike quality of his movie making, with the exception of the end, he went on you know with 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 Hook, and maybe even at some point there was like you know there was Jurassic Park, but then of course you know once you get to Schindler's List, Spielberg's way of making movies completely changes, so. Mm -hmm. This was kind of like the end of an era for Spielberg. And just that last shot just sums up everything so perfectly. But it's, um, you know, as I said, it's a smart movie. It's a well-written movie. And uh, it's just a joy always to go back and and, and watch it. And, and, you know, know what's unfortunate is that, you know, River Phoenix, you know, died. And I think that if they were ever going to do an young Indiana Jones you know, series, which they did, I thought he would just be the absolute perfect person for that role. So yeah, that is a shame. There's just so much to like and just so much to enjoy. And it's, it's a classic. It's an absolute classic. It's just a great trilogy of of films. I mean, no matter what anybody thinks about Temple of Doom, but I think that's fantastic as well. So I just, I love them all. I love them all equally. And uh, it's just a great time at the movies. Just something that amuses me about the final shot of the movie is they go from the, the temple outside which is was filmed in uh jordan right and then right. the sunset shot was filmed in amarillo texas <laughs> so it's these two places oh, was it really? yeah I, I was reading that earlier today <laughs> and so being a texan i'm like oh that's that's really funny they they, they leave oh, jordan and they transition into texas <laughs> that's fantastic it's, it's a funny little detail oh, it's beautiful i mean there, there's nothing like a texas sunset to be honest a west texas yeah, specifically uh, it's, it's beautiful yeah. so just a small detail that makes me laugh now that I know it. Um, oh, that's fantastic. But I agree. It is a perfect cap to that trilogy. I was reading also today that this was always intended to be a trilogy. 
Right. Temple of Doom was made three years after Raiders, and then this didn't come out until five years after Temple of Doom. And so mm. uh, Spielberg had sort of, he did Last Crusade sort of as a fulfillment of the promise that Lucas and him mm. had made together of making a trilogy. Mm. And I'm glad that they did because it does cap that sequence of Indiana Jones life at least perfectly. Yeah. And yeah, we've got Kingdom yeah, of the Crystal Skull, and yeah, they're supposedly going to be making a fifth one eventually. We'll see. Oh boy. <laughs> I I yeah. remain optimistic just because I do like a lot of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, even though I agree with a lot of the criticisms too. Yeah. Like I said, I just have special affection for that being my first theater experience. But still, in general, I think that Last Crusade, I will stand by it for now, is my favorite <laughs> of the Indiana Jones movies. Mm -hmm. uh, Raiders is a close second, although Raiders is the one I have a poster for hanging in my hallway. But anyways, really great yeah. movie. I I love Last Crusade. It's been a favorite for a long time here's one thing though i want to just bring up one more time um, uh, i always wondered whether indiana jones wore a tie in this film for half of it and is that because he knew he was going to meet his dad and he wanted to look oh. a little bit sharper because I, I i don't understand the origin of the tie i don't because once he puts on his outfit and i think the first time we see it after the portuguese coast because even during the the escape from venice he doesn't have his outfit on it's going to austria and he's wearing the hat the jacket the whole full outfit but he's wearing a tie and he doesn't wear the tie once he gets to the desert but he has it on and i'm wondering whether that was because you know maybe that's just the way he dressed to see his dad and i don't know i i don't understand the origin of the tie yeah like a certain expectation that his father would, yeah would have yeah Oh, that's really, that's, you've given me multiple things to like rewatch and watch for <laughs> this next time I go through. So thank you for that. It always confused me. Yeah. It always confused me. Yep. Well, with that, that's the end of the 88th episode of Cinescope. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining me once again. This was fantastic. I love talking about these movies. Me too. Contact for the show, facebook.com slash Cinescope podcast and at Cinescope pod on Twitter. Please consider going over to Apple Podcasts, dropping a rating and review. Hit that subscribe button so you get notified of new episodes. And if you have feedback or ideas that are longer, email to thecinescopepodcast at gmail.com. Now, Eric, where can people find you and your work online? Uh, you can find Cinematic Sound Radio at cinematicsound.net. You can also find me on Facebook at Cinematic Sound, Twitter, uh, Cine Sound Radio, and uh the podcast, of course, is on uh, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get great podcasts, you'll be able to find uh, the Cinematic Sound Radio uh, Network. I guess that's what I'm calling it now. And we have a plethora of amazing programming there. So I hope uh, when you get a chance, you uh, might be able to listen to a few shows. Absolutely. Your podcast is a great way for discovering new film music. That, that's what I've always used it for. And now I'm going to have to check out all of your new shows that are <laughs> part of the network. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of them well the best place to find me is at chadadada on twitter that is c-h-a-d-a-d-a-d-a -A -A -A. also facebook.com slash chad.hopkins and you can find my other podcast in american workplace which has since ended but we talked about all of nbc's the office episode by episode and you can find that where podcasts can be found and at workplacepodcast.com and all the show notes all of our contact information can be found at the cinescopepodcast.com thank you once again eric it's been a lot of fun Maybe we'll talk more Indiana Jones in the future. Maybe we'll go back and do Temple of Doom and you can talk to me yes. about why that movie is so great. Oh, I'll, I'll point you in the right direction because I recently did a, a show on uh, a John Williams podcast called The Baton and we talked about Temple of Doom. So have a listen to that. And if you want me to come back and talk about it some more, I will gladly talk about Temple of Doom anytime, anywhere. <laughs> Excellent. I look forward to it. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Have fun and celebrate movies. Yeah.